appreciate their ministry in a number of different ways at our church, but more so, I think what I appreciate the most is their light spirit. Whenever they enter a room, there's a joy as they bring their sense of uh, humor with them, and so thank you so much for your ministry this morning. Uh, Welcome all of you here, whether in person as well in uh, online streaming as we transition to more and more in-person worship and ministries throughout this summer. I encourage all of you who are online to uh, make that transition. And just a word of encouragement that worship was never designed to be online because part of worship is to be able to gather together with brothers and sisters in community to encourage one another through the act of worshiping together. And so uh, we encourage you as time goes and as you get vaccinated to make that transition and to come on out. Uh, we are continuing our series in the plot line of scripture. Last uh, week, Kukum preached on the Judges, the book of Judges. He introduced us to the book and then explored the life of Gideon. And uh, even as we look at Gideon, we see some of the character flaws uh, within that particular judge as he led Israel and now, uh, this morning, we look at Samson, where the character flaws are not just cracks, but uh, it explodes within his life. And one of the wee things that we realize through Judges is how Israel and the leadership as well deteriorate in terms of their relationship with God, in terms of the way they worship uh, idols, and especially in terms of the morality in their life. And so... I trust that God will bless you as we explore the life of Samson uh, this morning. Most of you have not heard of the name Michael Kennedy. Uh, perhaps all of you have not heard of him. You certainly recognize his last name, and perhaps you wonder, well, is he related to that famous family? Uh, I first heard of Michael Kennedy from a Time Magazine article because uh, uh, he had died in an accident in a ski slope, and it was chronicling his life, and it was sort of like a eulogy, and as I was reading it, I felt the tragedy of his uh, accident even more. For here was a guy who seemed to have everything it took to succeed in the world. He had graduated from Harvard, got his law degree from UVA. He was smart, but also compassionate. He had started a university, in the nation of Angola, he ran a nonprofit organization that supplied heat to 147 homeless shelters in Boston, and he worked in securing loans for women-owned businesses, and this is all before he was middle age. And Michael had a flair, a political flair that came with his last name. So he helped his uncle Ted win a tough Senate re-election campaign, and he was preparing to run his brother's campaign to uh, win the seat of, or win the governorship of Massachusetts. So he had the right last name. He had all the important connections, the finances. He had everything it took to make a significant difference in the world. And then in a moment that has become a cliche, he threw it all away for a three-year affair with his babysitter, who was at the time either 14 or 16 years old. And he lost it all. His wife left him, lost his family, lost his credibility. His brother Joe lost the gubernatorial race due in part to the political storm that surrounded his affair. And at the age of 39, he lost the opportunity to redeem his name as he died from a skiing accident. And if I asked Michael, what were you thinking? What was going through your mind? about How can you risk so much? I wonder what he would say. Perhaps he would give me a series of excuses to justify his behavior. Perhaps deep inside, he would not even believe what he was saying. But these excuses gave him just enough breathing room to sustain a three-year affair with someone that's not even out of their teenage years. This morning, I want to look at the life of Samson. His story is one that we're all familiar with, a tragic life from a tragic book. One could say that Samson had everything going for him. His birth was announced by an angel. Can't get much better than that. He had godly parents, or seemed to have godly parents, a calling to deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Philistines. He did not need to go in search of himself to find his purpose or calling in life. And he was gifted for his task. But here was a man agile enough to catch 300 foxes 
and yet strong enough to pull the city gates from its foundation and carry it 40 miles up a 2,000 feet ascent. To say that Samson was physically strong would surely be the understatement of the Old Testament. And he went on to record a series of legendary feats against his enemies. He defeated the Philistines in a number of minor skirmishes. But in a moment that became a cliche, he threw it all away by marrying the wrong kind of women and by engaging the services of prostitutes. And he lost it all. His reputation, his calling, his gift of superhuman strength, and his life all before he had the opportunity to redeem his name. And if Samson was here this morning, and if I had a chance to ask him, what were you thinking? I mean, what was going through your mind? How can you risk so much? Perhaps he would give me a series of excuses to justify his behavior, just enough room, enough breathing room to sustain his years of sinful pattern behavior. And perhaps... He wouldn't even believe his own excuses, but it gave him just enough room. This morning, I structured this sermon around four excuses, four excuses we tell ourselves in order to fuel unwanted or sinful behavior from one day to the next. Now, first excuse, first one. Uh, I'll start tomorrow. That's my favorite. I'll start tomorrow. I have a confession to make. Uh, it's somewhat embarrassing. I have a, a lust for sweets and fried food. I love pastries, cakes, muffins, sodas, fresh or fried fish, french fries, and my favorite, uh, fried Korean chicken wings. Uh, you thought kimchi was our number one export in terms of our culinary. You have to try fried Korean chicken wings, uh, chocolate crepes, ice cream was my favorite. I still remember the first time my father took me to buy ice cream at Baskin Robbins. You know, back in Korea, when you say ice cream, you only meant one flavor. It was all vanilla. That's all you got. There was no choice. But Baskin Robbins, 31 flavors with all kinds of sauces, toppings. Talk about the American dream come true for a kid. And I remember one time they had this promotional item called the Matterhorn. I still remember the name. There's eight scoops of ice cream, three different sauces, whipped cream, bananas, nuts, sprinkles. And the server kept telling me, you know, that's eight scoops. That's half a gallon of ice cream. And I ordered it, and I finished it, and she was so impressed that she gave me an extra scoop as a reward. That's the last thing I wanted. And I still remember driving home, and uh, my father's driving home, and I'm sitting and the back, and my sister and my mother keep wanting to touch my stomach because it had literally chilled, and you could feel how cool it was. You know, that's okay when you're 10 or 11 years old, running around and playing tennis every day. That's not much of a problem, but when you hit your middle age, and it becomes a major issue. And so I worked hard at controlling what I ate until one summer. A pastor friend of mine suggested we go on a quest, you know, sort of like a bucket list for that summer. And, I, I, you know, you thought it would be something like running a marathon or reading the top five novels ever written. But uh, he wanted to eat the top ten burgers as ranked by the Chicago Tribune newspaper. And so for that summer, we went from one restaurant to the other because, uh, you know, the only thing, sin that's tolerated among Christian leaders, that's uh, being a foodie, right? Being a gluttony is the only sin. And so we went through each of the restaurants that summer, and my eating habit just got shot. I was drinking soda left and right. To this day, I cannot eat a burger without drinking Coke, and uh, I think I became addicted to the point where my wife stopped buying soda in the house, and my low point came when I bought a case of Coke and left it in the trunk of my car so that every time she left, I would go out into the car, get a can, bring it into the house, and drank it. I felt like a drug dealer doing that. And I knew it was bad. It wasn't that I was ignorant. I could read the nutritional labels on the can. I watched the YouTube videos of what Coke can do. And I knew in my mind that it was unwise, in fact, downright stupid. But one of the things that I told myself that worked every time, you know, I'll start tomorrow. I'll start tomorrow. Because you see, that's a wonderful promise because it gave me freedom today to live it up, eat whatever you want, because tomorrow will be different. I'll change tomorrow. I'll start eating healthy tomorrow until tomorrow comes and the cravings just grow stronger. 
And after a while, you know, you give the same excuse and you don't even believe it. But it doesn't really matter because there's just enough hope there that I'll change tomorrow, that I feel free to enjoy the guilty pleasure today. I wonder if Michael Kennedy or Samson ever used that excuse. You know, just one more affair, just one more sexual encounter, just one more video. But tomorrow, it'll be different. You'll see. In Judges 14 and 16, we find the life of Samson there. But what is interesting is that Samson's life is told in two literary movements. So in chapter 13, we find the description of his birth. Chapter 14, Samson goes down to Timnah and climaxes with the slaughter of the Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey in chapter 15, verses 14 to 20. The second movement starts in chapter 16 with Samson going down to Gaza and climaxes with the slaughter of the Philistines in the temple of Dagon and the loss of his life at the end of chapter 16. What is interesting is how similar those two cycles are. Both sections end with a summary statement, chapter 15, verse 20, Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Chapter 16, the very last verse, he led Israel 20 years. Both begin with Samson eyeing a woman. Chapter 14, verse 1, he goes down to Timnah and sees a young Philistine woman. Chapter 16, verse 1, one day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. In both, there's an altercation with the Philistines, both of which were instigated by the woman in his life. So if you remember the story, he makes a bet with the wedding guest that had come to his wedding, and he gives them a riddle, and then makes a bet, and the guest cannot figure out the answer. They pressure the bride, look, if you don't find the answer from Samson, we're going to kill your father and your family. And so she goes to Samson and asks and asks and asks until he's finally he's worn down. He reveals the answer, and with that starting point, there's an escalation of violence onto a thousand Philistines or lying dead on the ground. And the second movement is Delilah, asking over and over and over again until Samson is finally worn down and that starting point, one thing leads to another until we find over 3,000 Philistines lying on the ground. In both sections, the text explicitly states that Samson wanted revenge. Right in the first, because the Philistines had burnt down and killed his new bride's family and father. In the second, because they had gouged out his eyes. In both sections, there's a cry of desperation to God, a prayer for hope. It's almost as if the writer of Judges was trying to tell us something about the life of Samson through these two literary cycles. That here is Samson in the beginning of his ministry. Here is Samson at the end of his ministry. It's been 20 years and nothing has changed. The same sin, the same struggle, no growth, no maturity, the same destructive pattern of behavior for 20 years. And I wonder if he asked himself and told us, you know, I'll just start tomorrow, I'll just start tomorrow, because if he did, I can sympathize. It's one of my favorite excuses because it's such a powerful excuse. I can enjoy my sin today because I have the fresh Start that I promised myself for tomorrow. And you make that excuse enough times. And one day you'll wake up and tomorrow is 20 years later. And nothing has changed. Second excuse. I can control it. I can stop any time that I want. I'm amazed by the number of powerful men who have fallen into sexual sin over the years. I know perhaps it's a 24-hour news cycle and we need news constantly. Perhaps it's the culture in which we live in. But there's a daily dose almost every other day. In fact, on Friday, there was another Hillsong pastor and sexual downfall. From the super gifted politicians to the spiritually gifted pastors, we have men and women who run global corp corporations, multi billion dollar organizations, run mega churches, who take incredible risks. And you wonder what's going on in their minds. There's an article that I read several years ago that tried to explain this phenomenon. I mean, why do men of power get trapped in such surprisingly stupid situations? Well, it's not because they're dumb. 
These are some of the most accomplished men and women the world knows, and why? The writer goes on to argue that these men wield a great deal of power in their respective fields. Their views become policy. They make decisions that affect the entire nation. Tremendous number of people's lives are affected. And soon the sense of power begins to create an illusion of control over areas outside of their jurisdiction. Soon they begin to believe that there's nothing that they cannot control. So they place themselves in highly compromising situations because they believe that they are still in control. And I wonder if that's what Samson saw. Because of all the number of situations that he gets in, he has the sheer amount of strength to get himself out. So it doesn't matter how many men the Philistines send. It doesn't matter what weapon he has in his hand. His strength gets him out of every single situation. There is no situation that he cannot control. And I thunder because he is physically strong outwardly that he thought he could control his internal lust inwardly. So when Delilah comes along, perhaps the warning light started to blink, but it didn't matter because he thinks, you know, because I'm strong in one way, I'm strong in every way, and I can control it. One of the most frustrating texts within the Bible, right? Just read through the Bible, and I was reading through this, and chapter 16 of the conversation from between Delilah and Samson. Every time I read it, my frustration level just ramps up because I just want to grab him, you know, and just slap him around a couple of times and say, can't you see that this woman is playing you. She's using you. How can you go through four cycles and not wake up? I mean, she baits him and she says to him, look, what's your secret? And he says, tie me up with seven fresh cords that's never been dried. Samson, the men are upon you. Tell me with new ropes that have never been used. Tie me up. Weave my hair into the fabric on a loom. Cut off my hair. See, each one, he gets closer and closer to the truth. Cut off my hair, and I will lose my strength. In a radio personality, Paul Harvey tells a story of how an Eskimo kills a wolf. The scene is grisly, but it offers fresh insight into the self-destructive nature of sin. So he writes, first the Eskimo coats his knife blade with animal blood and allows it to freeze. Then he adds another layer of blood and another until the blade is completely concealed by frozen blood. Next, the hunter fixes his knife in the ground with the blade up. When a wolf follows his sensitive nose to the source of the scent and discovers the bait, he licks it, tasting the fresh frozen blood. He begins to lick it faster, more and more vigorously, lapping the edge until the keen edge is bare. Feverishly now, harder and harder, the wolf leaks the blade into the Arctic night. So great becomes his craving for blood that the wolf does not notice the razor-sharp sting of the naked blade on his tongue, nor does he recognize the instant at which his insatiable thirst is being satisfied by his own warm blood. His carnivorous appetite just craves more until the dawn finds him dead in the snow. See, this is the illusion of sexual sin. It makes you feel so alive and you feel so much in control that you are the one with power, whether it's through the mighty dollar or through the remote control. You feel like you are the God of this encounter. And how ironic for how quickly the master becomes a slave. One moment you're in the driver's seat, the next moment you're trying to hit your ride from being on the top of the world to sitting in a 12-step program. Third excuse. God will be gracious. He will forgive me. For me, the saddest words in the Bible are found in Judges chapter 16, verse 20. Samson finally tells the truth to Delilah to cut his hair out. He's betrayed. And then look at verse 20. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll get out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. My heart breaks each time I read those words. 
If you read the life of Samson, four times the text says the Spirit of God came upon him with power. It's more than any other judge. I'm willing to go out and live and, and bet that perhaps it's more than any other Old Testament saint that the words, the Spirit of God, came upon him. In fact, when he was thirsty, he cries out to God and water gushes out from a straw, from a stone. That's amazing. And perhaps one day he started to believe that no matter what he did, no matter how many times, the Spirit of God will always be upon him because God is so gracious, so merciful, so forgiving. And perhaps one day the anticipation of grace became a presumption of grace. Don't misunderstand me. I believe in the forgiveness of God. I believe there's no sin that cannot be forgiven. I believe there's no limit to God's forgiveness. You we're called to forgive each other 70 times. Seven, how much more will God forgive us? But I also believe there's a limit to His grace when it comes to ministry and service. No limit to forgiveness, but there's a limit to favor. No sin can prevent us from drawing near to God when we repent, but sin can limit the ways in which God can use us. Think of time as a range of possibilities. So we're all getting older, right? And so one way to measure time is chronological age. I'm 57. Some of you are older. Some of you are younger. We can measure it that way. We can measure it by how old you look, right? Some of us look older or younger than our age. You know, 50 is the new 40, they tell me. One can measure it by accomplishments. Wow, she's so young for all the things she has accomplished. But there's another way to measure time in terms of possibilities. So that the younger you are chronologically, the greater the range of possibilities. So that when you're five years old and I ask you, what do you want to do with your life? The, the range, the possibilities are almost limitless. You can do whatever you want. But as you get older, the range decreases. Yes, possibilities still exist, but far less than when you were younger. So that when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. I read all these books on being an astronaut. I got a telescope. That was a possibility back then. That is not a realistic possibility any longer because as age increases, possibilities decrease. And death is the cessation of all possibilities. Now just replace time with immorality. It was sexual sin. The more immersed we are, the more limited our possibilities. That with each pattern of sin in our lives, the number of possibilities of the way that God could use us shrinks. It decreases until one day we experience ministry death. See, this is one of the most devastating effects of sin. It prevents us, prevents God from using us in ways that we will never know how he could have used us if we had kept our lives pure, right? They're clean vessels, unclean vessels. Some tasks God will use clean vessels alone. You know, I look at the life of Samson and I see a number of victories here and there and he has quite a resume and I, I have no doubt that God used him sovereignly. But I wonder if Samson was able to invoke the Spirit of God into his sexual urges so that he was pure before God, what God could have done. How could the story have been different? And what's so sorrowful is that we will never know and he will never know because his life had never changed in 20 years. Finally, the last excuse, as long as no one gets hurt, right? As long as no one gets hurt. This is one of the biggest lies in our culture. Someone always gets hurt above and beyond the participants. This is especially true with sexual sin. The consequences of the obvious ones that affect it, yeah, our family, people that you know, your friends, people at church, the next generation. But in every sexual sin, there are people who are affected that you do not even know of. Even in the privacy of your own home, you click that link, you are contributing to a culture that sees women as a means to the fulfillment of another's fantasy. We may never know how many people are affected by the things that we think no one else knows that we do. And when we come to Samson, it's not just about him and the woman in his life, but an entire nation is hurt. Why? 
Uh, remember, Samson's story is told in two movements, right? So Judges 14, Judges 16. And remember how similar those two cycles are. Well, in the story of Judges, in the book of Judges, it's broken down into a number of different cycles, each cycle for each of the judges. And in each of the cycles, you get this cycle of Israel doing wrong, right? And then you get the divine punishment, enslavement for an X number of years. Israel cries out. God raises a judge. He delivers them, and the land is in peace. It's almost like the writer was saying that after all of these hundreds of years of judges' rule, Israel has not changed one bit. Why? Because it's the same cycle from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. After experiencing the grace of God's deliverance for all of those years, their spirit has not changed. They have not matured. They have not grown. They continue to do what is right in their own eyes. No matter how many times God has delivered them, and Samson was no different. Still the same after 20 years, just like the Israel after hundreds of years. Samson was called to be a judge. He's supposed to lead the nation, not just militarily, but in terms of his character. And instead, he became a product of his culture. Because just as the nation of Israel became accommodated to Philistine culture, so Samson only pursues Philistine women. Just as the Philistine leaders were motivated by revenge, so Samson seeks vengeance. Just as Israel did what was right in his own eyes, one can put on the top of his tombstone. Here lies a man who did what was right in his own eyes. Of all the characteristics of a leader, there is one that is non-negotiable. Leaders have to lead. You cannot follow. They cannot make decisions by the poll numbers. They cannot reflect the culture. They're supposed to model and envision and move forward. In a study done exclusively for Newsweek a couple years ago, uh, Melissa Farley was a director of prostitution research and education based in San Francisco. She wanted to do a study on the attitudes of men who had engaged in services of a prostitute with those who did not. Now, by prostitution, she didn't just mean prostitution, but she included pornography, phone sex, and visiting strip clubs. And their method was to gather 100 men who had not engaged in any of these behaviors for the past one year to compare their attitudes with uh, those who had engaged in such practices. And the results of the surveys were somewhat predictable, but what shocked me was not their survey result, but the fact that it was virtually impossible for the researchers to find 100 men in their local area who would qualify as non-Jews. They couldn't find 100 guys that did not engage in one of those activities in the last year. And so they had to lower the standard. So non-users were now defined as men who have not visited a strip club more than twice in the past year, who have not used pornography or phone sex or, 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 or other sexual means more than once in the past month. Only then did they find a hundred qualified men. And before you say, you know, that's San Francisco. <laughs> You're not going to find that in San Francisco. When I was in uh, Illinois, I did a research. And uh, part of the country that used Google to find porno sites more than any other place was Des Plaines, Illinois. And you may not have ever heard of Des Plaines, Illinois. But the availability and ease by which our culture can access sexually explicit material is killing the soul of our next generation. And God has called us to be leaders in this area, not followers. Of all the people in the world, we are the ones that ought to have a handle in this area. God has called us to be royal priests. As soon as you become a Christian, you are a leader in terms of the way that we are to live our life. And when Christians fall and do not grow and change, we hurt a nation that longs for deliverance. When Samson was finally called, notice what the Philistines says in, in chapter 16, verse 23. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God, see, our God has given 
Samson, our enemy, into our hands. In other words, our God is greater than the God of Samson because we have Samson in our hands. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. But they said, our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country who has killed Many of us, every time there is another story of a Christian leader, a Christian congregation member, we are hand-gifting the world. Another opportunity to demean the cross and to speak ill of God. See, this is Israel. They're called to be a light to the nations, and they are no better. And rather than giving testimony to God, they are giving ammunition to the world. After a summer of feasting on burgers and gushing down Coke, I had a physical. I still remember that day with great clarity. Because when I went in, the nurse took my blood pressure and then asked me to step on a scale. And I knew I had gained some weight, but that was a wake-up call. I clocked in at 192 pounds. At BMI, I was officially obese. And my blood work came back, registered over 200. And then I went to my wife and I confessed. And she did not chew me out. She didn't get angry. She didn't say, I told you so. All she said was, you know, the kids will still need you when they're older. I hope you're still around. And that was all that she needed to say for me to wake up. See, no one sins alone. Somewhere, someone is always affected, and all the more so with sexual sin. May God grant us the grace to wake up. If you could pass out the communal elements. We're going to celebrate communion this morning. And online, if you have prepared the elements, please gather before you. And, you know, I, this is a strange call, but I feel the need to do so and I still don't know the congregation that well. But when we talk about lust, it's not just sexual sins, right? You can have a lust, uh, consumerism for possessions, for wealth, for your uh, uh, reputation, right? Saving face. That you can be lustful in a number of different ways. And if you feel like you are caught in addiction, that you can't seem to set yourself free, and you've been in it for a number of different years, you need to ask for help. Because, you know, one of the things that strikes me when I read the life of Samson is how alone that guy was. Right? I look at every Old Testament character, New Testament character, and there's always someone there, right? Now, Paul had Silas, Luke, you know, Elijah had Elijah, Noah had his family, Abraham, his sons, Jacob. Everyone has someone around it. But when I read the life of Samson, there's no one in his life. And there are times when you need to call out to God. And he sends his community around you so that through their encouragement and through their prayers, you can break out. Because in the cross of Christ, there's not just forgiveness. There's freedom to be set free so that you can make yourself a slave of God. And that's part of what the communion is about. And so on that faithful night, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the disciples took the bread, and they ate together. And after they ate the bread together, Jesus took a cup of wine that represented his blood. He said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood, where there is not just forgiveness, but there is freedom as well. And the disciples took the cup, and they drank it together. You know, I just want to give you a moment to just bow your heads and to just reflect where you are spiritually in your relationship with God. And just after about a minute, I'm going to ask Jethro to close us in our response song. Mm-hmm.